Hello, good morning, good morning everyone. I'm pretty excited for this panel. Um, we have pretty big names here, and what we will cover in today, again, all the trends that will be shaping the cryptocurrency scope in the next few years. So I will quickly introduce today's speakers. We have Jonathan from Suyet, CMO, Andy, Head of Sales of Bitpanda, Gonzalo, VP of Government Affairs of American Express, Ruptus, Chief Commercial Officer for BitMEX, and Michelle, Global Marketing Director of Dipcoin. So big applause, please, for them. <laughs> Great. So let's start with the first question, because we do have quite an interesting panel and a few things that we'll be covering. Um, so the first question will be for Jonathan. Uh, what kind of financial services will become vital for the financial ecosystem in the next few years? Well. <laughs> That's a quite broad one, <laughs> but, but maybe a good entry point to the panel. Um, and we guess that um, we will see that the ecosystem will expand quite a while from what we know. Uh, we, we just had a short discussion on the side uh, regarding cryptocurrencies and uh, how they will be implemented in the area and realm of regulated financial entities. And um, we see that there's still quite a well, lack of knowledge and, and lack of will to implement, I guess. Um, but I think the, the prerequisite to, to get into that um, is as well um, modularity. We as well touched briefly on the aspect that um, the ecosystem or the IT systems, better to say, in the financial entities um, are quite monolithic and uh, are lacking flexibility to adapt and um, that that's going to be crucial um, if we want to enter a new era of financial services where it's easy to adapt and to connect and to offer um, a value added uh, for a very specific area and target group. Good. Thank you so much for that input. Now, Gonzalo, same question, but now moving forwards to payment solutions. Um, how do you foresee the world a few years from now in terms of integration of new crypto payment gateways? Well, it's... Um Quite difficult to say since uh, evolution of uh, payments and crypto is going quite fast. Uh, we've seen in the last few years that uh, capital markets, financial services, uh, international schemes, paying companies have embraced or are starting to embrace uh, crypto. Consumers uh, have definitely embraced crypto. For in the case of Spain, we have four million and a half users that hold crypto in one way or another. So it's definitely growing. Um, when something grows, it brings the attention of uh, legislators and regulators, especially when we can see that uh, some systemic risks uh, can uh, emerge. The latest developments of uh, Celsius, Solent, or uh, Terra Luna are an example of uh, issues that put on the radar of uh, regulators uh, potential problems that might arise, and normally regulators start legislating before issues happen, especially when we take into account uh, precedents as the one of Lehman Brothers or others that uh, were very problematic and they definitely want to avoid it, especially uh, in a sector that is still unregulated and where companies are in a kind of testing mode, uh, as is our case or the case of uh, payments in general. Okay. And now, um, recently, actually a few weeks ago, um, Amex launched its first crypto uh, product uh, on, with the hand of Abra. So I just wanted to highlight a little bit more on that. Um, how do you think crypto rewards credit cards will be impacting the lending payment industry, the lending and payment industry in 2022 and 2023? Talk, talk to us a little bit about that partnership and how it has impacted your sector specifically. Well, Abra, so the partnership with, and between Abra and American Express is, uh, is part of this uh, learning experience and testing experience in which uh, we're involved. Uh, every single company in payments or financial services is monitoring, learning, and following from very close uh, crypto developments. Uh, specific use cases are something that are still being uh, studied because uh, from a payment perspective, Paying with crypto is not cost efficient and is not uh, a possibility yet. Um, Abra was created in 2015. Uh, it was so the partnership with Amex started from the very beginning. 
Uh, and this is part of uh, the bet on innovation and evolution that Amex uh, sees on uh, payments. The card that Abra puts into the market for the time being in the United States um, aims at uh, making payments uh, available and at the same time providing its users with uh, crypto back, being able to trade with crypto, borrow uh, to crypto holdings or even uh, earn from interest. Um, it's at a very early stage, but uh, we definitely see that it's a, a good learning experience in which we definitely want to uh, be part of it. Great. Thank you so much. Uh, great partnership, by the way. I hope we're space is watching. And Andrew Purchase, so I think, um, again, we do have uh, quite big names um, with Bitpanda and Bitmex. Um, together and one thing that I want to jump on is the role of crypto exchanges in the in this new era for financial services. So what do you think, um, probably Ruptus, you can start first, what do you think it will be the role of crypto exchanges in ensuring financial stability in this new era and more importantly how crypto exchanges are building these secure financial market infrastructures to increase adoption in the next few years? Thank you for that question. It's quite um important to, if you reflect what has happened in the last couple of weeks um, in the spot market, but as well in the derivative exchanges as of on our platform, um, in order to gain trust and stability, um, it needs a robust platform and it needs a robust service provider. I don't believe volatility in, in, in essence is a problem. I've, our market makers did a tremendous performance in the last couple of weeks. They made a lot of money. Um, and reason for this is because the system is stable, the system is robust, the system is scalable. And in an ideal scenario, you combine a stable system with a stable infrastructure with a regulatory umbrella. I guess the times of um, operating in the shadow world um, under some kind of dodgy license from God knows where, is over. Um, Gonzalo mentioned it. Um, financial institution, institutional adoption of the crypto space will only happen in a regulated environment. It's a big step already for financial institutions to tap into crypto assets or securitized assets or tokenized assets in any shape or form. It's a big step um, to move in that direction for technical reasons, and they do only want to partner with regulated entities. Because if I'm a regulated financial institution, I cannot put my clients' assets, funds into risk with somebody not being regulated. So there must be an even par game battlefield. Um, and only those exchanges who, who have received or will receive shortly a, a regulatory shelter and umbrella will succeed, and the rest will move more and more in the kind of shadow and dark world. And there are fans for it. I mean, and not everybody likes transparency and, 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 and regulatory guidance. But if you are talking about mass adoption and bringing the digital space into the next level, it needs to be a fully regulated environment. Yeah. Yeah, on top of that, I completely agree. I think, you know, to some extent, CFI exchanges are that financial you know, infrastructure that those FMIs you mentioned. And we're responsible for not only what you all mentioned, but also educating people, right? Getting education out there within DeepCoin, we're the small potatoes exchange, but uh, we, of course, with all of our trading functions and everything, we make sure that we have some sort of learning in the app, whether, whether it be a question mark next to the function or within our help center to make sure that people are edu you know, educated about what's going on in the trades especially with like derivatives and leverage spending. Uh, I think that it's very important uh, you know, to make sure that assets are separated from different wallets and you're not you know, getting forced liquidation and, and losing thousands of dollars, right? Which did happen to a friend of mine. So uh, yeah, you know, all these things are important for building trust in the community, having that transparency, like you mentioned. I think uh, Ruptis, uh, those two key words that you used, uh, trust and stability, are, are core to you know what centralized exchanges actually do. Um, I think engagement with the regulators is a key theme for for most centralized exchanges. Um, you know, it's great timing this week. Uh, Bitpanda has actually just had registration with the Bank of Spain as a VASP. You know, I, I I mean I know a number of our peers have have VASP res registration across Europe as well. 
Um, I think that with uh, the, inter the, the publishing of Loomis Gillibrand a couple of weeks ago, um, that, that's probably going to prompt European regulators to really firm up Mika and deploy it as quickly as possible. I don't think they want to get beat into the post uh, by, by the US regulators. Um, and I think centralized exchanges are uniquely placed to be able to engage with regulators and ensure that any financial mar market infrastructure that's built uh, it is done so um, with, with that context in mind. Yeah, no, I pretty much agree with the two of you. Now, which assets, crypto assets, um, do you think it will be leading the retail market in the next few years, specifically in retail? Let's leave the investors, uh, the institutional ones um, aside. Um, which crypto assets and services will be the ones that crypto exchanges are now focused on? Which are the ones that will be leading the market? Uh, baby dodge to the moon? Yeah? No. <laughs> uh, no, in all seriousness, uh, I'm not sure, but I think what we're dedicated to is just making sure that there's a diversification of assets, you know, available to investors, whatever they, you know, of course you want to have projects that are vetted and, you know, well thought out, but just making sure that you're allowing that for the average crypto people is my take. And maybe, I think the ETFs are kind of cool. Love to see how those evolve. I guess the... Crypto is not going to disappear again anymore. I think it's, it's going to be established as an asset class or as a new underlying, it's not even necessary. Some consider I had the discussion with Andy early on. I mean, in, in fact, crypto currencies are nothing else but FX. Uh, we used to trade FX 30 years ago, now we trade Bitcoin. It's the same old thing. Um, just booked post-trade a bit more difficult than normally you trade fiat. But in terms of additional products, um, I think, the new technology is going to lead into a, a substantial decrease of production cost of new products. If you consider how a stock is issued as in an IPO process, how bonds are issued, um, how dividends are paid, how funds are uh, monitored and, and, and maintained and dividends in a fund are dispatched to the holder of the fund, this to me sounds like a historic history book. Um, and enough, not a lot has changed in the last 30, 40 years. Now is the time where all these processes are changing. With, with the help of smart contracts, with the help of blockchain, with automatic ledger, with transfer of assets, with instant payments, because the, the blockchain knows who owns the asset and who deserves the dividend payment is instant transferred. This is going to make a tremendous change in the financial world going forward. And I guess this is not necessarily meaning that stocks will not be traded anymore. I mean, you can't beat in terms of speed, at least until now. You cannot, you cannot beat the speed performance of a fully electronic tradable stock on the Xetra Stock Exchange in Frankfurt. You can't. Not any blockchain protocol is fast enough to do handle that kind of volume. But in the post-trade, if I consider how Clearstream in Frankfurt or AMF in, in, in or, um, Euroclear in, in France, how post-trade settlement and assets holdings are maintained, that is just very antique. And new technology will enable to strip down those prices and of custody to prices of product production, and which is to the benefit of the, of the end users. Very, very interesting view. Andy? Yeah, I mean, I think it's a quite an interesting question to someone who works in an institutional exchange. So um, I'll, I'll try and maybe answer this from the perspective of um, our institutional clients and then how that relates to the, to the retail client base that they service. Um, so I think that um, I think the next 18 months are going to see um, an acceleration of, of two streams within the retail market. So massive acceleration of mass adoption. Uh, and then a real sophistication of the products that are available to retail investors. And, you know, the latter will be facilitated by better regulation and better oversight. I think when it comes to the mass adoption, um, you know, for me, um, it's got to be GameFi. Um, you know, I was on a panel this time last week um, in Brussels, and we were actually talking about, um, you know, the, the, the business model of uh, the gaming industry and, you know, who was going to be the first mover of the mainstream gaming companies to actually you know, uh, jump onto the crypto bandwagon. And I think yesterday it was leaked that GTA 6 is going to have a, an in-game in currency. So I, I think you've, you've now seen that. That's now been the pivot. Um, I think obviously NFTs are going to, um, you know, continue to, to 
be mass adopted, especially when you see like real world applications of those, uh, whether it's fractionalizing property, whether it's fractionalizing art, um, or, or securitizing really anything at all. Um, and then I think that, you know, back to my point about the sophistication of the products avail available to retail investors, you know, um, I think in the derivative space, um, those, of it, those of us who come from TradFi are, are very used to the dominance of, of US dollar denominated derivatives. I think especially for European retail investors, I think things like Euro futures, Euro options um, could really come to the fore. Uh, and that'd be very exciting to, to be able to service um, our institutional clients who are there and servicing their retail clients with those products. I really like uh, your point of view on that. And actually, I'm going to introduce an extra one here. Um, which, ones, which products do you think are going to gain less traction in the institutional space? In, lending. You want to. <laughs> Well, you say lending, um, um, I tend to agree, but the, and I was mentioned yesterday during the panel, and um, I think Tim Grant from Galaxy Digital managed to make the right message here. Lending and borrowing is part of our economic system. Without Absolutely. borrowing and lending, everything is not going to fly far, that's for sure. So it's a question of how do you monitor your risk and how, how you control your risk and when do you pull the plug and tell the customer guy, I'm sorry, you have eaten up your margin. Either you bring fresh funds or you have to close your position. And that's, that's how the world goes around. So um, the question will be, is there a traditional finance, financial institution, bank type of thing willing to take that role of a prime broker, custodian, um, collateral provider, um, our classic slap desk, so stock lending and borrowing, that's what it is. I guess it will not disappear, it just will be more controlled and people make sure that the funds are really there and when somebody wants to withdraw the funds, that the funds should still be there. That's, yeah. that's the key. That's not the question of lending, it's the question of how to control the risk for lending. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more actually, and I was being facetious when I said lending. Um, I think those of us who saw uh, 2008, um, really the last few weeks, you know, it wasn't the end of the crypto world, it was just crypto's version of 2008. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, there was plenty of lessons learned out of that. I think the, the TradFi um, market is infinitely more sound than it was, um, you know, 15, 20 years ago. And I think the crypto market will, will also benefit from, whilst it's been very painful for a lot of people and a lot of individual investors, and it's very sad, um, the overall crypto market will, will very much benefit from the lessons learned of the last eight weeks as well. So. You know, to the point about lending products, you know, I don't think we're going to see, you know, really silly APYs anymore. I think we're going to see, you know, a real fine tuning of the risk tolerance of uh, the institutions that offer those products. Well, Andy specifically has uh, years of experience in TradFi. So, um, if you don't mind me asking, which products in TradFi do you think that it will be key to, tra to tr translate into the crypto space that in, next, in the ne next few years? It's, um, it's a good question. Um, so, you know, if, if you think about the TradFi markets, um, most, I mean, to Riptus's point, most of them are severely antiquated. I mean, they're, they're running off of infrastructure processes, concepts that were founded, you know, decades ago. Um, I think if you take even, you know, the most liquid trading product on the planet, FX, spot FX, uh, the infrastructure for that is, is, is terrible, really. I mean, why are we in a world where it's still T plus two settlement? Um, you know, so I, I do think that, uh, and obviously some of the major players on, on Wall Street and, and European banks are, you know, are, you know, dabbling in real-time settlement. And I do think that there will be, uh, you know, a lot of innovation. I do see it coming first in the FX market. You know, we're, we're already seeing it um, in, in, the, in the crypto market. So, you know, we, we partner with companies like um, BCB, which you know enable us to do real-time settlement, um, which is actually also facilitates us to do real-time settlement not only in crypto but in fiat too. So I think you're starting to see the cross-pollination of of uh, real-world blockchain technology into traditional finance. Yeah, Ruptus, any view on that? Oh, I couldn't agree more. It's um, it's. An additional product sweep that I can see is going to make its way through is um, making unbankable assets bankable. Um, this is something which is uh, of key essence. I visited most recently a couple of um, 
Geneva-based Swiss private banks sitting on trillions of dollars uh, of assets under custody and very wealthy customers and they own a lot of property and even the account manager, the wealth manager of these guys, they don't know the exact number, how wealthy is my customer. And if I don't know his precise wealth, I cannot give him the best service because I don't know what his liquidity situation is. So if I tell them we can actually tokenize this building and it, it gets a price tag and there will be exchanges where you can trade non-bankable assets suddenly making bankable and you find market makers who will be able to price that piece of property and provide a bit of offer spread and you can do fractional trading. It enables a lot of alternative um, asset classes and ways of, of servicing uh, wealth customers if you add new products to it and the technology is there for it. Um, it just needs to be the willingness of the banks, of the financial institutions to make that step. And it's, as, as Andy said, the systems are just crap, to be honest. You, sorry, my French, but it's just crap. And um, the, 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 the impact uh, of blockchain in a core banking system cannot be underestimated because you are com comparing apples with bananas. And people do not know how to get a, a security token or a crypto position in a core banking system and in order to risk manage it, in order to, what do I have to have capital uh, position in it? How do I produce a report that the customer sees in his statement? This is what he holds in crypto and this is what he holds in classic bonds. It's very complex. Yeah. And that's, the, that's unfortunately the time deciding factor, how much are financial institutions willing to invest in the new technology and how long does it take? And new challenges, Trade Republic, Bitpanda, um, all these neobanks, they come up with state-of-the-art new technology. They don't have that problem that the classic finance has. Um, and that's why I'm so bullish on all these neo brokers and financial institutions who now come with this blockchain-based, fully electronic adaptation systems, which is going to be the future. Um, Jonathan, in fact, I think this is the best chance. Uh, Jonathan, you have been working for securities in the last few months, and you have a pretty pretty similar view to RIP2. So what's your yeah, yeah, exactly. It's just what I was thinking when these two were elaborating about the issues on post-trading services, um, that um, the issue is that you have a settlement system that uh, takes two days until the, set the securities arrive or any asset arrives, um, at least two days, to be honest. Um, and that's exactly what we are tackling at Swired, right? To, to enable that we have, uh, at least for the institutional side, for regulated financial entities, an ecosystem where you can move any kind of asset. And um, I guess from a trader's perspective, uh, it isn't interesting solely trading a certain cryptocurrency. You want to move it against something different because you want to have different viewpoints. You want to have different expectations. Then you start getting liquidity into the market. And um, I think that's as well key to the adaption part of um, cryptocurrency. Not, 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 this, not the only prerequisite, but I think it's one, one core element to get that into the um, financial infrastructure we have and to make it compatible. Um, and you said already cryptocurrencies are scalable. Um, I think they have to become interoperable <laughs> um, as a next step. And, and that's pretty exactly what we want to offer, um, that ecosystem where you can start establishing different use cases on top of it and um, the different financial services that you can book if you, want to need, if you want to use them, if you need them, and to combine it in your unique way. And um, there's exactly the part of modularity and interoperability to combine it with scalability. And what we are experiencing right now is the technological depth of classic institutions. Um, they, that's such a burden. That's what I try to emphasize with the monolithic design of uh, IT infrastructure. And of course, newer players have an advantage because they don't have to deal with the technological depth. Um, but they will um, get to that issue soon, as, uh, sooner as they think, I guess. And um, we'll have to find a way around it as well. So um, I guess it will be interesting to see if there is some kind of core petition, I guess, to collaborate uh, on the infrastructure side and to get the different entities together with the common sense that on the business side, there will be competition and it will be fierce. Just, um, just to follow on that point as well. So, you know, coming from someone who works in a 
crypto exchange. I want to drive volume onto the, onto the exchange. All my peers do as well. Um, it, when you when you kind of look to the institutional client base, the clients that are going to do that are going to be the asset managers. And you know, one thing that's going to get asset managers up and running is the right reg environment. The second thing is, and when you talk about real world traditional finance problems and where blockchain can solve them, is in the allocation process. So anyone who's worked in traditional finance and worked with asset managers knows that allocations are a mess. So quite often they're done post trades. So a block trade is done, and then an asset manager communicates, you know, which funds um, uh, parts of that trade are, are then allocated to. The number of fights that break out between banks and asset managers when this goes wrong, um, you know, there's breaks. Um, the, 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 the business that can get the allocation process right on the blockchain between asset managers uh, and, and the exchanges or, or anywhere you want to trade is the one that's really going to win in this game, I think. Really, really good way to put it. Um, now, I do know that there are a lot of questions out there um, because we have quite big names in the panel and every point of view was very interesting. So I will entertain probably 10 minutes of questions. Um, we'll open the Q&A. Any question to the speakers? Any questions? No questions? <laughs> Chris. Okay, I too. Apologies, I cannot see you because of the light. Uh, Chris, we like to go first and then... Yeah, uh, my question is, I guess, to the exchanges. How do you see the landscape evolving with centralized exchanges versus decentralized exchanges and even the potential for traditional exchanges coming into the space? How do you, how do you see that evolving? Uh, it's a great question. Um, so, obviously, I'm biased to centralized crypto exchange. Um, you know, I think in terms of um, trading, we have the edge in terms of latency. Um, crypto is inherently volatile, so in volatile asset classes, you want to reduce latency as much as possible to reduce slippage, and then obviously to uh, to avoid PNL. Um, so, you know, I think that that's where centralized exchanges have have the edge. Um, I do think that um, there is going to be a really important interplay between um, CFI and DeFi. Um, you know, I think that there are custody products out there on the market which enable clients to, you know, effectively have a bridge between the two worlds. Um, so I don't really see it being, um, uh, whilst I'm biased towards um, the centralized exchange world, I don't really see it being one's going to win over the other. I think the two will coalesce together. Yeah. I also, I also think that centralized exchanges are really important for onboarding new people and bringing in, you know, new crypto users, you know, or just anybody that's retail-wise that doesn't know much about the crypto space, I think CFI is really, you know, where you're going to get that safe wallet, right? I understand you're not going to have your own private keys, but if you're new to this world, you kind of need somewhere you can go, to, you can trust to uh, have a safe wallet with multi-factor authentication, uh, you know, just a password. For us, if you want to withdraw to, you have to put in, we have at least three asset codes if you want to withdraw anything. So we want to make sure that your assets are all in a safe spot. So, you know, I think CFI exchanges are really great at that, at onboarding people. And then, you know, once you evolve and you learn more about the space, you move on to DeFi, you move on to other products out there. I think you see a constant evolution. Um, classic exchanges uh, are moving into the crypto space or the digital asset space, such as Börse Stuttgart or SIX exchange in Switzerland. Um, a lot of initiatives, um, Euronext has just indicated, uh, Deutsche Börse invested in crypto broker, crypto finance in Zurich. So there is, there is a, there's definitely a, a direction from classic exchanges tapping into know-how and experience in the centralized exchange business for crypto. Um, and the next step is then the, the DeFi space. I think we are just about to st learn walking I guess the DeFi space is actually running. So if, if it might take a bit more time to establish and then get experience and an understanding for for investors how the central how the product as such works before entering into the space. So there will always be smart cookies around who are excited in new technologies and doing your own financial uh, management and they are uh, excited in, in DeFi products and projects and earn additional yields uh, and or save even more costs for transactions. Um, but I think it is a process from one to the other. And, and remain, remember what I said earlier on, uh, it, needs, it needs a regulatory umbrella to, to get it going and in the DeFi space it's even more difficult to find fully governed providers. 
Thank you to the three of you. And the second question, who was it? Please go ahead as loud as you can so they can hear. I mean, I don't know if it's the holy grail. There's plenty of problems out there to solve. Um, I think that real-time settlement does, it does improve trust in the market and it also massively improves liquidity as well. And, you know, I think, so if you're looking to improve liquidity in the market, which obviously will then improve the overall health of the, the, the liquidity ecosystem, then maybe it is the holy grail. Well, and I guess um, settlement side, at least considering central bank money is missing in the ecosystem, um, if for as well, uh, crucial for um, regulated financial entities, you do not want to move commercial bank money and getting it into counterparty risk that you could do indeed uh, in, in real time. So I, I, I don't know if it's the holy grail, but um, it's, it's maybe the last puzzle um, or the last element of the puzzle we are missing, at least for regulated entities, to truly get into that space, because then you can achieve some kind of delivery versus payment. Um, because for the time being, all we can see is a free of payment as an instruction, where you always have counterparty risk until the other side fulfills their duty. And um, we could show uh, last year uh, in the securities lending area where we actually moved securities, not cryptocurrencies, so sorry for that, um, but we moved um, securities and uh, in an atomistic way we achieved a delivery versus delivery state and uh, showed uh, that we could uh, replace the securities on one side and achieve um, delivery versus payment, so technically this is feasible, that's not an issue. Um, but we are simply waiting on a solution, or uh, as well searching for a solution on um, central bank money on the blockchain or related to blockchain. Um, because then, I guess, um, there is no reason or there is no argument anymore to say we are unable to enter this space. I would say from a payments perspective, um, until there is not an instant settlement, it will be very difficult uh, to get merchants embracing uh, crypto. Because the main problems that they are facing is trust in crypto and the uh, possibility that if they accept some or other crypto, while they, are, they do the clearing and the settlement, the value uh, has changed and they have lost uh, the sales. Yeah. So when this will be solved, it will be much more easier to get merchants accepting crypto, even if they will settle instantly. Uh, th sorry, it, this, is, this is super important and um, it's, it doesn't come by surprise that a lot of um, government central banks are considering the initiation of a, of a central bank, euro, digital euro, digital pound, digital remimbi, digital Swiss franc, whatever it is, yeah. um, in order to facilitate instant settlement uh, without any delay uh, and without any price risk. And as you rightly say, if you pay your Amazon order in Bitco uh, Bitcoin now, uh, by the time Amazon receives the funds, they might not be equally to the amount you, you owe to the company and to the, to the seller. So that's, that's one of the key, of the key initiatives, um, how to speed up payments in crypto or use uh, the help of, of, of digital central bank money. Um, and I know of, 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 of various initiatives, in, in, uh, especially in Europe, where, where the idea is born, products are done, and uh, I'm carefully using the word stable coin because we just learned that not every stable coin is so stable. Um, if, but if you use uh, central bank issued um, stable coins, I think that would be a great step forward. Michelle, we'd like to wrap up that one. I think these gentlemen said it all. Great, I'm just here, pretty face. When, if, if I'm allowed to add, <laughs> still to add, yeah. is that um, especially in times of crisis, the instant settlement will be key um, because if you don't have the element of um, trust, uh, mistrust or surprise, 
um, if, if your funds or your assets will arrive in two days, um, this might be the reason why you do not trade in the terms of cri in, a, in a moment of crisis. But if you know it's instant settlement, um, there is no reason, again, holding you back and getting into the market because you know um, there is no risk in regarding the fulfilling of the duty uh, of, 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 the, of the trade. Okay, thank you so much. Um, unfortunately, we're running out of time, so I do need to start concluding this panel. It has been an exceptional one. Thank you to everyone. Um, I think that Andy, uh, Gonzalo, Jonathan, Riptus, and Michelle will be around for questions. If anyone, please approach them. I have learned a lot from them in the last two days. And yeah, thank you so much for attending this panel. And thank you. see you in the next one. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you, you very much. much.